Well, hello, Spring Lake Village. Uh, this is Nick again. It is now Friday, the 25th of September, and uh, we're going to wrap up our four-part series of lectures on uh, famous British explorers. And um, for our final lecture, we will examine the remarkable life of Gertrude Bell, a woman who was at once a distinguished scholar, poet, author, historian, archaeologist, linguist, explorer, mountaineer, but she's perhaps best known as a Middle East intelligence officer and the woman who was instrumental in the creation of the modern country of Iraq, formerly known as Mesopotamia. So Gertrude Bell was born Gertrude Margaret Lothian Bell on the 14th of July in 1868. And she was born in Durham, which is located in uh, North uh, Eastern England. Um, her father was uh, a distinguished uh, upper class uh, businessman who was the son of Sir Isaac Lothian uh, Bell, who served as a liberal member of parliament while Benjamin Disraeli was prime minister. Gertrude grew up in a household that was always discussing important political matters of the day, and she became very, very interested on political events and um, how the British Empire was um, emerging um, and spreading its empire throughout the world. Um, her grandfather had um, made a fortune in um, steel, uh, and the family grew up in uh, very great uh, comfort. Her father, um, Bell, um, had married uh, one Mary uh, Shield, but uh, sadly his first wife died just a few weeks after the birth of Gertrude's uh, little brother, Morris, uh, and the two children um, were very much traumatized, um, especially Gertrude, who had had a very close relationship with her loving mother. And she reveals in uh, many of her correspondences how that uh, death very much um, traumatized her uh, in her early years. And she suffered from uh, various uh, bouts of uh, depression. But when she was about seven, um, her father uh, did uh, remarry one Florence Olive, the daughter of an Irish doctor, Sir Joseph Olive, and a very devoted attachment soon formed between the new Lady Bell and uh, Gertrude and her little brother, uh, Morris. Now, Gertrude, although she played with dolls and um, had her own little garden, she was uh, very energetic uh, and she read a great deal, especially uh, history. Uh, Florence, her new mother, had been um, a rather well-known playwright and a distinguished author of children's stories. And as I mentioned, um, she formed a strong attachment with her uh, stepchildren. And Florence uh, would give birth uh, to three Half siblings, half siblings, a brother, Hugo, and two sisters, Elsa and Molly. And Gertrude had um, a very good relationship with her half siblings. Uh, Florence did instill in young Gertrude a sense of duty and decorum, and she also very much uh, recognized how intelligent Gertrude was and told her, told her to further her uh, intellectual pursuits um, at a very young age. So Gertrude was very fortunate, um, not merely because she was born into a socially privileged class, but because both her parents recognized early on that this was a young girl with many talents. And she was, of course, physically restless, but they saw early on that she was a truly gifted child intellectually. Therefore, at the age of 15, she was sent to Queen's College in London in order to complete 
her secondary education. Gertrude was um, something of a prod prodigy and she excelled in nearly every class except for scripture and soon discovered that she, um, she was something of, a, of an agnostic. Um, most of her uh, older uh, peers in her family um, were quite agnostic. So she wasn't, um, didn't really embrace um, Christian uh, doctrine uh, very much. And later she uh, declared herself um, an atheist and did not uh, believe in the scriptures. She also wasn't interested in many of the areas where young women were being um, educated, especially music, sewing, and cooking. But what she loved more than anything else was the study uh, of history in which she um, excelled. As a result of her talent in school, um, she was accepted into Lady Margaret Hall at Oxford. This was the only um, school within Oxford that permitted women. And she majored in history and would eventually attain first class honors in modern history at the uh, University of Oxford in 1885 the first woman in England to achieve first class honors um, in history. One of her um, classmates um, by the name of Janet Hogarth described uh, the teenage Belle in her early days at Oxford when she wrote, although Gertrude was only 17, I saw her as half child, half woman, she was rather untidy, but she had beautiful auburn hair, greenish eyes, a brilliant complexion, a curiously long and pointed nose, and a most confiding assurance of being welcome into, into our uh, societies. Obstacles had a trick of melting away when she encountered them. There were so few that could not take in her stride. We know um, that she was um, presented uh, to Queen Victoria at her uh, debutante uh, ball. And then um, also she um, had a number of suitors, but none um, actually formally um, asked to asked her in marriage. And because there were no uh, career options uh, in the offing, she decided that she would head off to Iran, where she would spend uh, some time in Tehran with her aunt and uncle, uh, Mary and Frank uh, LaSalle. This was in um, 1892. Um, like a uh, Mary Kingsley, whom we uh, met last week, Gertrude also had a great talent uh, to learn languages, especially Middle Eastern languages. And while she was in um, Tehran, staying with her aunt and uncle, she began learning uh, Farsi, a uh, uh, Persian, and uh, rather quickly was uh, able to converse uh, with the locals living in uh, Tehran. Later on, she would also go on to learn Arabic uh, in Turkish, as well as a number of uh, European uh, languages. Uh, Gertrude was uh, multi-talented, not only um, intellectually, but she was a great athlete. She learned uh, horseback riding, shooting, fencing, da dancing, and as we will discuss in a minute, she'll become a, a rather avid and well-known mountain climber. During the um, 1890s, uh, she traveled with family or friends who had important social and political connections, constantly expanding her network um, wherever she went. She visited many historic places and spent hours each day 
uh, reading on new subjects. It was during her uh, stay in uh, Persia that she developed uh, a long lasting love affair um, with the, uh, the Middle East. And um, as I mentioned, she made a number of very important contacts not only uh, with local officials, but with many within um, the British um, diplomatic corps. Um, like uh, Mary Kingsley, she also would write a number of very important books about her adventures in the Middle East. One of her earliest was um, called Persian Pictures, which are reflections of her stay in Persia um, during the uh, 1890s. She also um, published um, poems from the Divan of Hafiz, which she had translated from Farsi into English. She wrote hundreds of letters and kept her diary all the time, building up her knowledge of the people, history, and culture of the places that she experienced during her many travels in the Middle East. In 1899, she visited uh, Palestine and Syria. And um, she also went to various, par various countries in the Middle East um, that were part of the uh, Ottoman Empire. In 1900, she visited uh, the rose red city of Petra and the great, um, city of Palmyra as well as Basra. And during this period, she also became extremely proficient as a photographer. She learned much about a um, photographer and many of her books that she would uh, publish included um, her photographs. This um, talent in photography would also serve her well as a archeologist on the field which we'll discuss in a minute. Many of her photographs were of great historic significance. In fact, they preserve some Islamic and Crusader buildings that um, no longer exist. She also took important pictures of the German uh, engineering uh, infrastructure that was taking place uh, along the Hejaz railroad between Damascus and Medina. And these photographs providing very important uh, information about what the Germans were doing uh, would be valuable to British military uh, cartographical and intelligence specialists. Um, she also photographed and drew Maltese ruins. She excavated um, Byzantine sites along the Tur Turkish coast and took many uh, photographs of important monuments um, in Anatolia. And then um, we find her uh, returning again to uh, Jerusalem and Damascus. And during um, her journey, between Jerusalem and Damascus, she befriended uh, many of the Druze living in the Jabal al Druze. Now, again, we've uh, explored the lives of uh, Lady Stanhope as well as uh, Mary Kingsley and uh, discovered how these two women also had uh, developed uh, strong ties uh, with the Druze. Um, her journeys uh, through Syria would result in uh, one of her most acclaimed uh, works called uh, The Syria, the Desert, and the Sown. And uh, also during this particular sojourn in 1900, um, her photographs also were of great importance, especially uh, the photography she took in Antioch and Alexandretta. And she also took a number of um, important photographs during a journey to um, India. So over the course of the next several years, she would travel to India, uh, Arabia at least six times, uh, producing a number 
of very important uh, photographs. Again, these would accompany a number of her books. She was very instrumental in making Westerners uh, of the Arabian uh, Peninsula, and that would lead to um, further exploration of this region um, in subsequent years. So as I mentioned just a short time ago, uh, Gertrude was a, a great athlete. She prided herself on her uh, physical um, acumen. And between 1899 and 1904, she became um, quite an accomplished mountain climber. She began climbing uh, a few years earlier, especially during uh, family holidays um, uh, in France, so already back in around 1896 and 1897. In 1899, um, she ascended uh, uh, the Meje uh, ascent, as well as uh, Les Acrens in the French region um, of the Alps. And um, she continued to uh, challenge herself with other peaks in the Swiss Alps as a member of the uh, Alpine Club. Now, at the time, there weren't um, many active female uh, mountain climbers, so there wasn't really um, uh, the proper um, gear or clothing uh, for women uh, mountain climbers. So, as she described, she would take off her, her skirt um, when she was uh, mountain climbing, and her guides would um, continue um, you know, uh, helping her and assisting her as she made her ascents, ascent, um, and she would make her climb in her, uh, in her uh, undergarments. Gertrude was one of the first um, to climb the famous uh, Engelhörner in the Swiss Alps, and she recorded um, a number of new paths on her ascent up the uh, Bernese uh, Alps. Um, one mountain in the uh, Bernese Alps is named in her honor, the Gertrude's Spitze, or Gertrude's um, Peak. Now, she almost um, died during an ascent up Finters, Finters Horn in um, 19, in the summer of uh, 1902. Um, this was a, a harrowing experience when a blizzard hit. Uh, she spent more than 50 hours um, uh, dangling from a rope on the uh, northeast side of the mountain, um, you know, clinging to the rock face. Um, but eventually, uh, guides were able to uh, rescue her, but it was for her one of her most um, harrowing, harrowing experiences. She not only um, scaled mountains in the Alps, but she also um, took part in a number of climbing adventures in the Middle East, and including uh, Mount Carmel in Syria, which won her the accolades of British Colonel E.L. Strutt, who described um, her mountain climbing ability in 1926. He said everything that she undertook, physical or mental, was accomplished so superlatively well that it would indeed have been strange if she had not been shown on a mountain as she did on the hunting field or in the desert. Her strength in Incredible in that slim frame. Her endurance above all her courage were so great that even to this day, um, her guides and companions were amazed at her uh, ability and they forever admired and venerated her. Gertrude also earned fame as, a, as an archaeologist. Um, as early as 1905, during her journeys to Syria, Palestine, and the Levant, um, she fell in love with the, uh, the growing discipline of archaeology. And during the course of her life, she would meet 
some of the most celebrated British archaeologists of the day, um, including the famed New Testament scholar William uh, Ramsey, whom she would join up on excavations uh, in Binberg Kelisa. Uh, and these excavations produced a very important scholarly monograph still hailed today as one of the most important works document, documenting uh, Byzantine churches um, in Anatolia. She also um, discovered a, a number of ruins in northern Syria on the uh, eastern bank of the uh, Euphrates uh, River Valley. And then in early January, she left uh, for Mesopotamia and she participated in excavations at Karkemish, um, one of the most important uh, Hittite uh, settlements. Um, she was instrumental in field study work at the ruin of Ukadir. She also visited uh, Babylon and uh, Najaf. While in Karkemish, she met a young man who would uh, go on to become one of the most famous um, individuals in the history of, of Arabia, none other than T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. And she herself, of course, would later be acknowledged as the uh, female Lawrence of, the, of Arabia. So the uh, London Times um, actually did uh, record their first encounter. Um, and it was, it didn't go over particularly uh, well. She wasn't terribly uh, impressed uh, by him. And, uh, but Lawrence um, felt quite intimidated by this woman who was, he quickly realized, was uh, very conversant on many topics, especially what was taking place in the Middle East. He was impressed by her knowledge of several Middle Eastern um, languages, especially Arabic. And in fact, um, he felt put out that her Arabic was um, superior to his own. Um, Gertrude described him as a rather um, interesting uh, boy who was going to make maybe a rather uh, fine traveler. Well, the two of them, of course, would meet up again um, in Cairo, and both would play a very important role in the reshaping of the Middle East um, after World War I. Here's a map um, showing where the great city of Karkemish is uh, located. You see here in um, southern Turkey, but she did travel throughout Syria and um, Palestine, later Transjordan. And of course, this is uh, Iraq, uh, former Mesopotamia. And then she traveled throughout a good deal of, of the Arabian Peninsula, especially along the western coast, along the Red Sea, the Hajiz region. Um, and uh, also her journeys um, throughout Anatolia, present day uh, Turkey. So Gertrude would be given the title Queen of the Desert. And she really was seen as sort of this almost mythic regal figure as she made her um, sojourns um, through the Arabian uh, Peninsula from um, Jerusalem. And she describes uh, in many of her letters and also the uh, correspondence um, from others who knew her well of her many journeys of this proper upper middle class British woman um, traveling um, with many of her fineries and accoutrements accompanied by cooks and her guide, all were local. Um, during her first um, expedition, she learned early on that as a result of her fair skin, she would have to uh, protect herself well from the elements. 
so immediately she donned um, a kafia, um, a scarf, and um, usually in many of the pictures you see her donning um, a big hat. But these iconic images of her eyes peering out, um, uh, just you know, peering out below her, above her scarf and below her hat. Um, she also had a muslin um, sleeping bag. It was something she had um, specially uh, sewn just for her to protect against um, the uh, sand flies or fleas that were um, numerous um, while she was um, encamped uh, during the desert. She also, um, like uh, Mary Kingsley, learned a number of survival skills um, that would serve her well as she was um, traveling um, during the, in the desert. And she also learned the uh, proper protocols for presenting herself before many of the tr chieftains of many of the um, Bani or the various tribes of the um, uh, Arabian uh, Peninsula. I mentioned um, she had become uh, conversant uh, in Arabic, and she um, also became skilled in a number of the uh, local uh, dialects of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, which um, served her well in her many um, contacts. And uh, again, as I mentioned, um, it was during this period that she was hailed the uh, queen of the desert. We know too that she brought with her two tents, um, a writing table, and um, her most um, comfortable uh, chair. And uh, she also could um, create a convertible bed and a bath. So even though we find this woman uh, braving uh, the desert, she's intrepid, this intrepid, uh, explore the as queen of the desert. She did like uh, many of the uh, amenities from uh, back home. Oftentimes, even in the desert, um, she would put on uh, expensive uh, finery. She um, wore uh, fur coats, um, beautiful veils. Uh, she had her lavender soap, her expensive uh, hairbrushes her expensive um, silver case, um, cigarette case with uh, Egyptian cigarettes. Um, she dined um, with her Wedgwood uh, tab table service, um, crystal glasses, her expensive um, silverware candlesticks. She also would um, bring um, guns with her that she would um, present to important um, chieftains, um, and also she presented them um, with binoculars. So as I mentioned, um, she was an accomplished photographer and she would document um, everything she saw along uh, these travels, not only desert scenes, but also imagery of local chieftains, um, um, et cetera. And her uh, work as an archeologist and her studies in cartography would result um, in, in important um, original field work study. And many of her maps of the region um, are still of great benefit um, to uh, archeologists um, uh, even today. So again, for her, the documentation of ancient ruins and the landscapes she encountered um, was for her essential. You know, she saw herself as uh, an important scholar contributing um, uh, uh, much uh, information. And in so doing, she did become the first woman to do um, a solo journey into the uncharted uh, deserts of Arabia. And for her work, the Royal Geographic uh, Society awarded her the very distinguished Founders Medal. Now by 1912, uh, Gertrude's travels 
had given her a critical insight into the increasing turmoil in the Middle East. One of her letters actually presages the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. As she wrote, I should not be surprised if we were to see in the course of the next 10 years, the breakup of the empire in Asia. The rise first in uh, Arab autonomies and then of Armenia as well. So in the case of the Arabs, she was um, completely correct. By the end of 1913, she set out once more for the Middle East. She was driven not only by her consuming passion for the people and archaeology of the region, but also the need to um, escape uh, England. Uh, one of the reasons she returned to the Middle East in 19. 13 was to chase after a man she had fallen in love with, one Captain Charles Doughty Wiley, who happened to be the nephew of the famed desert explorer um, Charles uh, Doughty. Um, he had, C Captain Charles was a married man, but the two of them had a passionate uh, love affair, sadly. He would be um, killed at the uh, Battle of Gallipoli in uh, 1915. When World War I um, broke out, she uh, served the war effort uh, by working for the Red Cross in France. But then in 1915, she was invited to join the British intelligence um, in Cairo as part of the newly formed Arab Bureau. And in so doing, she would become the first woman officer in the history of British military intelligence. As a result of her thorough knowledge of the Middle East and her proficiencies in very uh, Middle Eastern languages, her expert knowledge could assess the political situation of the Near and Middle East, uh, Arabia, and Persia. And from March of 1917, her uh, office would be um, located in Baghdad. Like T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, she longed for a unified Arab nation but she realized that that was probably uh, impossible. So she really pushed for the establishment of separate autonomous um, in independent uh, Arab states. Um, before she had traveled to Baghdad, um, where she would spend the rest of her life, she was given the title of Oriental Secretary with the status as a assistant political officer um, during her brief stay in uh, Basra. As Oriental Secretary, Gertrude would be of great assistance to Percy Cox in his post as British High Commissioner during these troubling times, and Gertrude herself would exert disproportionate influence when which made itself felt beyond Baghdad and Cairo to London and even Paris where the Treaty of Versailles was being hammered out at the end of World War I. So in Baghdad, she would become quite active uh, in nation building. At the time, um, Mesopotamia, later to be known as Iraq, uh, was occupied by the British. And um, they were fighting the Turks for the oil rights to the region. As you know, um, the Arabian Peninsula was a very um, strategic prize for the British with the uh, discovery 
uh, of oil. But the occupation of this region uh, was a very expensive enterprise uh, for Britain. In 1918, a judicial officer, Sir Edgar Bonham Carter, and um, yes, he actually is uh, an ancestor of the famous actress, Helena Bonham Carter, um, began to discuss with Gertrude the idea of an independent Mesopotamian uh, state, uh, eventually called um, Iraq, in which Arabic um, would become uh, the official language. Uh, it would have a court system that would recognize both British common law as well as Sharia law, which is the supreme jurisprudence of Muslims. And this was, of course, to uh, appease the Sunni and Shia populations. As you know, um, the Mesopotamian region is a mix of Kurds in the north, Sunnis more or less in the central region, and uh, Shia um, in the south. And also, she was um, far-sighted uh, Gertrude Bell in the desire for educating um, young women with the establishment of new, new schools that had uh, female teachers. So Gertrude would play an important role in the creation of Mesopotamia, but it would have uh, repercussions, especially the boundaries uh, for a future state of Kurdistan in the north, um, which would not be realized um, even at that time as uh, Mesopotamia was uh, being um, created. So. Um, by August of 1920, Great Britain had received from the League of Nations a mandate, sort of like the forerunner, of course, to uh, the United Nations, the, the brainchild, of course, of Woodrow Wilson, the League of Nations. Uh, Britain had received a mandate to administer the territory of Mesopotamia, which stretched from Mosul to the north and to the Persian Gulf. And the British helped sponsor elections in which the Sharif of Mecca, the guardians of the holy sites of Mecca and Medina would be instrumental in naming the new monarch of this newly created state of Iraq. So here we find Gertrude's center stage in the creation of the modern state of Iraq. At the famous conference in Cairo in 1921, which was um, put together by Winston Churchill, one of the main aims of which was the creation of the Iraqi state and carving out its boundaries, we find Gertrude as the only woman uh, present at that important conference. And in some of the subsequent history, very little mention, there's very little mention um, of her. But as you know, uh, Gertrude was very instrumental in advancing Prince Faisal, Fa Faisal Ibn Hussein, a direct descendant of the prophet, to be, um, to be established as the new Iraq's um, first monarch. And Faisal would become the first king in 1921. And Gertrude's dream of an inter independent uh, Arab nation was realized. But as she soon discovered, um, the new Iraq was far from tranquil. Some of the tribes were rebellious. There was serious uh, religious disaffection between the Sunni and Shia sects of uh, Islam. But by June 1926, uh, several encouraging events had transpired. 
An Iraqi parliament had been formed and many of the boundary disputes had finally uh, been settled. Bell had attended the ceremonious state banquet um, held by uh, King Faisal to celebrate the signing of the boundary treaty he had made with the Turks. But it would actually be the last fu function that she herself would attend. Gertrude um, had a strong personal relationship uh, with uh, Faisal, as did um, Lawrence of Arabia. And the, the British early on knew because of this charismatic leader that he would be very important um, to the uh, British cause and their adventurism in this part of the, uh, the Middle East. So uh, Gertrude became something of a, of a confidant for uh, Prince uh, Faisal. He turned to her uh, very often. And um, in fact, she was played a major role in the creation of the first flag of the new Iraqi state. Because of her knowledge of antiquities in the region, and all her field work as an archaeologist um, throughout the Middle East, he named her Director of Antiquities, and she herself took it upon herself to write uh, many of the important um, laws that would prohibit the removal, the exportation of finds discovered um, in the state of Iraq. And in fact, that piece of legislation prohibiting the removal of antiquities became pretty much the template um, for most subsequent pieces of legislation regarding um, the removal and the disposition of uh, antiquities. For her, one of her greatest achievements was the establishment of the famed uh, British uh, Museum uh, I should say the Baghdad Museum, today the uh, Iraqi uh, Museum of Antiquities, which um, holds some of the greatest treasures dating as far back as the third millennium BC, if not older, some of the most famous Mesopotamian antiquities are to, were housed here. Um, you may well be aware of the fact that it was heavily damaged and plundered of some of its most famous treasures um, during the Iraqi war, but virtually all of those treasures, I think save for one, um, were rediscovered and are once again um, housed in the uh, Iraqi museum. Um, so she regarded this um, as her one of her great um, accomplishments um, and for her work, um, one of the wings of the uh, museum is uh, named in her honor. So uh, Gertrude suffered from um, actually quite a few uh, ailments during the uh, course of her life, off and on, off and on, and she, um, was a heavy smoker uh, all her life. Uh, you see a number of photographs of her smoking. Um, she suffered from uh, bronchitis. Uh, she suffered two bouts of uh, malaria, um, etc. cetera. So um, in 1925, she would return for the last time to London um, to visit her family at which time she discovered that most of the family fortune, you know, the fortune that had been made in the uh, iron and steel industry by her grandfather and father had been lost and um, the family uh, ancestral home had to be sold. Her doctors, because of her ill health, told her not to return to Iraq. Um, it would be very difficult for her to survive the very hot 
humid um, summers of uh, Baghdad, but she was um, drawn to this region. She just absolutely loved this uh, part of the world. And so when she returned uh, from London back to uh, Baghdad, she came down uh, with uh, pleurisy. And she also fell into a deep depression at this time. And uh, on the evening of July 11th of 1926, um, after uh, an event at a swimming party, um, she retired to bed and told her maid to wake her up the next morning at around uh, six o'clock a.m. But when the maid found her the next morning, she discovered that she couldn't be awakened. There, were, uh, there was a bottle of sleeping pills beside her bed and it's assumed she had taken uh, an overdose. Um, you know, there's still some debate as to whether or not she committed suicide or just accidentally um, took an overdose. But she passed away just a few days um, shy of her 58th uh, birthday. Two years later, she would be named a CBE, Commander of the Order of the uh, British Empire. And just a few months uh, later, would receive another Founders Medal from the uh, Royal Geographic um, Society. Uh, the current monarch, George V, um, even sent um, special condolences to her surviving parents. So Gertrude Bell was an extraordinary woman um, at a time when many of the major diplomatic players, uh, both British and French, were men um, who were responsible for the reshaping of the Middle East after World War I. And although uh, the, in subsequent decades, um, Bell would not be given her rightful due as one of the principal architects of the reshaping of the region, today she is recognized as one of the main uh, protagonists. But it wasn't simply in the area of nation building that she's remembered today. We see her as one of the great explorers of the region, um, like Freya Stark and Lady Stanhope. She would explore uh, many remote areas of the Middle East, especially the Arabian Peninsula that were dangerous, uh, areas that few men had explored prior to her. She would establish herself as a very important archeologist, um, contributing much um, to that science. Her books are still um, widely read uh, today, and some of her works remain in the area of archeology span among the most important works of scholarship, especially her study on the Byzantine uh, churches of Anatolia. So Gertrude Bell then wraps up our um, hopefully exciting uh, exploration of these remarkable uh, women. Next week, uh, a whole different topic, but I believe um, a timely one. Um, one that um, I think you'll uh, enjoy uh, as, it dis as we're gonna discuss uh, some controversial elections. As you know, we have an important election um, uh, that takes place on uh, November the 3rd. Uh, but this um, five-part series will examine some controversial lectures some of which were too close to call on election night. I think the series of elections will be very um, instructive um, and enlightening and very um, 
entertaining, I think, as well um, during the uh, as we um, approach this uh, very important uh, lecture taking place uh, in just a few weeks. So um, I hope all of you have a great week, and I look forward to seeing all of you uh, next Friday. Believe it or not. October already in the month of October on the uh, 2nd of October. So take care for now.